Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the vision series at East Georgia State College. Uh, this is a series of performances, uh, lectures, scholarly presentations that are generously made available to the college through a private funding source that has provided this series over a period of many years and has richly enhanced the academic intellectual life of this community. Today, it's our honor to have one of our very own, Dr. John Durden, uh, lecturing to us today about Camp Lawton the world's largest prison. Uh, Dr. Durden began his research on this topic uh, at a very early point in his life. <laughs> <laughs> and after this uh, early uh, venture into the research, uh, Dr. Durden went on uh, to earn his degrees uh, at University of Georgia, both his uh, bachelor's and his master's in history, and then later to earn his PhD in history. Now, he did all of that after finishing an educational experience, much like many of you students are undergoing here at East Georgia State College, because he earned his associate's degree at Reinhardt College in Georgia. Now, it's really important to this community to know that Dr. Durden is one of the charter members of the faculty of this college. And to say that we're proud of him and his accomplishments is really to seriously understate the matter. Uh, Dr. Durden represents the very best of East Georgia State College. And he is now serving as Professor Emeritus of History. He's director of this series the Vision Series, and he's also the director of the Heritage Center that's located right across the atrium in the library. I had the pleasure this weekend of a little more to the present of participating as a member of the uh, group that Dr. Durden led on the Sherman's March tour. And I can tell you that this was really uh, one of the best uh, single day academic exercises that I've gone through in a number of years. Uh, students that are in the room, I think you really get a sense as you listen to Dr. Durden of the process that a historian follows in order to reach conclusions about what is meant today by what took place in the past. And so I think we're in for just a fascinating hour with Dr. Durden this morning. And I'd ask that all of you turn off cell phones and other electronic devices and just really uh, enjoy uh, this uh, hour-long tour uh, with Dr. Durden about the world's largest prison just down the road near Millen, Georgia. Dr. Durden, thank you for thank being you. here. Thank you, thank, thank you. Good deal. Okay, and I'll pull it up. There you go. Good. Thank you, President Bomer. And uh, I'm not the only charter faculty member here today. I see several in the audience as well. <laughs> so let me begin today 
uh, I want to read a brief excerpt from, from the introduction to the book, and I think that'll help set the stage for what I'll be doing later. A loud piercing whistle, a chuffing engine, and billowing clouds of smoke rising above the treetops announced the arrival of another train from Savannah at Millen Junction. Trains were a daily occurrence at this small railroad town, but this one was different. It was the second week of October, 1864, and the poorly maintained locomotive pulling a ramshackle collection of cars carrying its human cargo had spent almost the whole day puffing inland from Savannah on the war-worn tracks of the Georgia Central Railroad. Since early morning, the locomotive had chugged across a landscape reflecting the signs of fall. The preponderance of evergreen southern yellow pines in the forest through which the train steamed was counterbalanced by the interspersed stands of hardwood trees colored by the change of season. The locomotive's most difficult obstacle along the tracks was the slow climb over Paramore Hill, the highest point along the line between Savannah and the junction. After a brief stop in Millen to take on wood and water, the train built up ahead of steam and renewed its journey taking the right branch of the junction's Y and heading slowly up the tracks toward Augusta and its cargo's destination in the Piney Woods. For that cargo, forlorn Union POWs and their almost equally forlorn guards, it was only another stage in what had already been a taxing journey. About five miles north of Millen Junction, the train slowed to a stop, accompanied by the loud, prolonged hiss and clouds of released steam. The guards detrained, established a perimeter, and offloaded the POWs. Formed into a loose column, they shuffled westward from the railroad through the woods to a large clearing prickly with the stumps of hundreds of freshly cut trees where stood an enormous, just completed log stockade. The next six weeks, for the next six weeks, this prison pen was to be their home. They soon learned its name, Camp Lawton. For some, it was to be their last stop before they were exchanged and returned home for freedom. For others, it was to prove to be simply another way station in their continuing odyssey through the Confederate prison system. And for still others, it was to become their final resting place. I'm going I'm to kind of step down and get in the aisles with you as I, as I do the program today. I call this the resurrection of Camp Lawton. The book that I wrote uh, it was portions which I just read to you from. It really took me three years to write it, but it's really a 40-year process. I got interested in uh, Camp Lawton um, about 40 years ago. I got interested because when I came to Swainsboro in 1973, I, probably during that first year, I made my first trip to Magnolia Springs just to go to the park. And when I went up there, uh, one of the things I saw was this marker here, which mentioned a place called Camp Lawton. Now, I'm kind of an amateur Civil War historian. My PhD is in European history. But I always, like a lot of people, always read a lot about the war. And so uh, I, I was surprised I'd never heard of this at all. And uh, so I began, when I got back, I began to look and see what I could find out. And I found really nothing much had ever been written on this story. And yet it was called the largest prison in the world. And so I began to research and see what I could find. And uh, finally, I ended up going to the official records of the War of the Rebellion and looked up every reference I could find uh, to the prison. And I realized, even though the story had not been told, there was a story to be told. Uh, at least the, the outline was presented in the documentary uh, record. Now, when I went there, uh, what you could see, essentially, was there were several earthwork, a couple of earthworks back in the woods. If you've ever been to Magnolia Springs State Park, up on the ridge above the stockade site is a pentagonal-shaped fort with artillery ramps around the perimeter. Uh, that was one of the, one of the things I, I saw there. So when I went to the records, I began to find out more information about it. And so in the official records of the War of the Rebellion, Brigadier John Winder, who was, the, uh, he was in charge of the Confederate military prisons in Georgia and Alabama in the summer of 1864, uh, he had, when, he's the one that uh, oversaw the construction of the prison. And he sent to Richmond, Virginia, to the Confederate government, a map of what he was intending to build. And what he built was a log stockade uh, the walls were 12 to 15 feet high, uh, constructed logs set up vertically side by side. They would dig a trench about five feet deep, put the logs in there and backfill it. It's uh, 42 acres in extent, so it's about a quarter of a mile per side. So it's really talking about a mile of digging 
a five foot deep trench, maybe three feet wide, through a wooded area. If you've ever done any digging in a wooded area, you know you've got to cut through roots and so forth. So there's no backhoes. This was all done by hand by slaves and by some union POWs who volunteered to do the work. Uh, the prison was built in Magnolia Springs because there was a spring that connected to a stream, so there was a, a good flow of pure water that came through the prison. They dug a, a, a ditch here to provide for latrines for the camp, so the drinking water was in the upper stream, bathing water here, and then the, uh, latrines were here. And inside the stockade, they had a, an area called the deadline, which is a low uh, fence. And the prisoners were uh, told that uh, you know, to touch or cross a deadline, guards were authorized to shoot them. And if there's one or at least one, at least one maybe two shootings that I, I documented from uh, the history of Camp Lawton. Now, they never did build the avenues the way these are constructed here. It never was laid out quite this neatly. But the stockade was built, the deadline was built, the latrine ditch was dug, and notice he said each division, and each one of these is a division, will contain 1,000 men and may contain 1,250. Camp Lot was built to replace Andersonville, or what's officially known as Camp Sumter. And if you know the history of Andersonville, you know in the summer of 1864 there were 33,000 POWs on 26 and a half acres. Everybody's heard of Andersonville. This was larger. Didn't have as many POWs there, but it was physically larger and probably was the largest stockade prison of, of the Civil War. Uh, so it was built to replace Andersonville, and uh, it had more room. Uh, it had, uh, uh, there was more wood for prisoners to build their huts, and there's also a much better water supply here as well. Now what I'm going to show you at the beginning of this program is I'm going to show you the, what, the views that we had of Camp Law. These are the, the kind of pictures, the drawings that I was, you know, first began to look at to see what the stockade looked like. There are no photographs of Camp Law. Now, we'll, we'll never, I don't think, find any photographs. The only photographer we're aware of that visited the site was with Sherman. He did not take his photographic equipment up to the site, uh, and he, he took no photographs. Uh, so this is, uh, the, uh, the next four slides are from two of the popular magazines of the day. One was Harper's Weekly, and one was uh, Leslie's Illustrated Newspaper. They're both weekly uh, magazines, news magazines. They were kind of the 19th century version of Time and Newsweek, and uh, they had uh, drawings, lithographs in them. This is from Harper's Weekly. Notice the date's January 7, 1865. The person who drew this actually was with Sherman, saw the camp, drew a sketch, and when Sherman got to Savannah, he shipped these north so they could be printed. And this shows the stockade. As you can see, it's a, uh, basically a square stockade, vertically placed logs. And these are guard towers, or pigeon roosts, as they were called, at regular intervals along the wall. It's hard to see, but there's actually a fortification uh, area uh, up here. Then the sailors drew an interior scene. Now, he saw the camp abandoned, empty. But this gives you a sense of the size of it. You're seeing less than half of it here. The wall goes down to a point, cuts across here, and it would have come on back here, and it would come in behind us. What you see here are brick ovens, which were constructed for the POWs to, to fix their rations in. But most POWs, the POWs apparently never used the brick ovens for cooking. They really did not like to put their rations in these big uh, pots because they were afraid that what they put in, they wouldn't get out. You know, so they wanted to cook their own rations. And these apparently were used in cold weather. POWs would climb inside and huddle up against the brick walls against the, against the cold weather. The camp was first opened probably the first week of October 1864. It's going to be open for six weeks before it has to be evacuated. It's evacuated the last week of November 1864. So the artist who saw this saw the camp empty, and he's, he's put some people in here. But uh, all the tents and uh, blankets and you know, those kinds of things had been taken away when the uh, uh, POWs evacuated the camp. So it looked very, very bare. But you can see the kind of hovels that some of them had built to, to live in. Notice there are also some trees in the compound. Andersonville, they, they cut all the trees down out of the compound. Uh, this is Leslie's Illustrated Magazine. Another artist drew this. And again, the exterior of the stockade to a corner. And the stockade comes down this way. There's actually a portion of the gate illustrated here. You can see a fortification here uh, surrounded by these uh, defensive stakes. And you can see the, uh, the uh, stumps where the uh, trees were cut down to, ma to make the stockade. And then the same artist who drew the last picture drew the interior of the stockade. It looks very much like the, uh, uh, the, the one that uh, Harper's Weekly had, except here he's used his imagination to populate the stockade. It's pretty fanciful. Guards were not standing on platforms along the deadline. The deadline was a fence. But here you have a guard shooting a prisoner, and that was kind of a popular motif 
uh, uh, northern stories about southern prisons. And you see the same kind of little holes in the ground, and here you have some kind of malefactors being marched off by guards. Here you have bodies loaded into a wagon. That would have been true enough. Uh, people died at Camp Law, and several hundred died in six weeks. But here you see, again, the brick ovens uh, laying across the uh, landscape there. And then another thing I uh, uh, used to, to find out about uh, the history of Camp Law is I went to POW accounts. And after the Civil War, it was a popular genre of writing, POW accounts. The Northern Pope was fascinated by stories of people who had come out of the, of the Southern prisons because of the reputation, you know, there was, there was kind of a, a black legend about Southern prisons. And so this was written, this, uh, I got this out of a book written by John McElroy, who wrote one of the more popular accounts. And notice it says, a house builded with our own hands. He and some uh, colleagues went in fairly early. They were among the first ship, uh, train loads that went in. And they found where the Confederates, when they were building the camp, had trimmed trees, some of them in the stockade. And so uh, they gathered up the wood and made themselves what they called a shebang. Uh, that was a common name, a shebang or a hut or a hovel. Uh, and notice they piled up dirt around it and the hapless POW was there with his head in his hands. And you can see that they've, they've rived some boards here and made them a, a, a little shebang. And again, you can see the wall and the, and the guard, uh, guard uh, places in, in, in the back. Here's another shebang here, which is just basically looks like a shelter half uh, tent uh, cover, tent fly. And people have dug into the ground and they're kind of, they've kind of got an area where they can lie down and get out of the wind. Another source, a contemporary view of Camp Lawton, is this is a, actually a, a blow-up of a daily march map of Sherman's march. Uh, Sherman had topographical engineers with him on the march. And when I first moved here in 73, people were taking me all over the place to show where Sherman had spent the night. I know where he spent the night, okay? The maps show where he spent the night. And uh, I think to a lot of Southerners, probably any guy on a horse with an officer's uniform was General Sherman, and uh, they spent the night everywhere. But uh, this, this is the kind of map of the detail. They show the houses, uh, where the houses were. Big Buckhead Church is right here. Here's a house. Marching along the road, there's the stockade. And you see the stream running through the stockade. This little thing, this is a mill. There was a, a Perkins lumber mill down below the, the stream. The dam is still there. It's broken, but you can still see where the mill was. And then they, they, they marched across this way. Shows where they crossed the railroad. Shows some roads that they crossed. And notice it says, stockade where Union prisoners were kept. This was drawn in 1864. And notice December 3rd, 15.52 miles. That's how much that unit had marched that day. So that's an, another indication we have of the, the location of the stockade and also what it, what it looked like. And then uh, the guards were a group of uh, reservists, Georgia Reserve troops, but there was also one regiment, the 55th Georgia Regiment, that uh, served as guards. And this is a drawing of a, a member of the 55th Georgia. Kind of shows you the typical Confederate accoutrements. Uh, he's got his cap box, and he's, he's got uh, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, container carrying his ammunition. He's got his uh, rifle with a bayonet. He's got a slouch hat. Pretty typical of an infantryman. Uh, really ready to go into battle uh, without, without his uh, backpack and all that kind of thing. Then uh, another thing I saw when I went there, uh, you know, in 73, 74, is there was a cement slab down near the stream. Stream runs here that ran through the camp. Everything you see here was in the camp. And I saw these two beams there. And they began to deteriorate. And I learned later that they'd been dragged from the stream back in the early 70s. And uh, they'd just been out there, and they were deteriorating. And then, then they disappeared. I didn't know what had happened to them. But I knew that there was some thinking that those might have been from the stockade. Uh, probably not stockade timbers, but maybe bridge timbers. There was a bridge across the stream, or perhaps even uh, timbers that lined the latrine, because they, the accounts say that they actually boarded up the sides of the latrine ditch, built a kind of a little dam where they could they could release the water and flush the whole, the whole thing out. Uh, and so uh, if, if those are, if those were from the stockade, I've been told by archaeologists they're the only known Civil War prison timbers in existence. There's, there's, there's none other known. And of course, they were in wa underwater, and, and, and you know, they, they were preserved for a long, long time. Uh, now, the story of the book. For years, I had this little 35 millimeter slide presentation. I went around and talked to civic clubs and so forth. And uh, some of my fellow faculty members have suffered through it before, too. Uh, so anyway, uh, what, what, uh, in, in the 1990s, 
the Virginia Historical Society was approached by a family that said they had a collection of Civil War material from their ancestor, a man named Robert Knox Sneedon. Turns out that Robert Knox Sneedon not only kept an extensive diary of several thousand pages, small pages, but he also was an artist and he drew several hundred colored drawings of various Civil War scenes, some of which he had seen, some of which he had not seen. Among the collection, and this is what the documents looked like, they'd been, in, they'd been in bank vaults and storage houses ever since the 19th century. They'd not been seen since the 19th century. And uh, among the drawings were six or seven drawings of Camp Lawton. He had been at Camp Lawton. And my eyes popped out when I saw this. Virginia Historical Society then, uh, well, let me finish this. This, this example, this is, how he, this is how he decorates his diary. You know, this is his handwork here, and this is self-portrait, and he says, Army Diary, War of the Rebellion, 1861-65, by R.K. Sneedon, 40th New York Volunteers, Mozart's, Mozart's Regiment, uh, Third Army Corps. And then the Virginia Historical Society then bought the material, and then they put out two very nice coffee table books, and many libraries have these now. I bought both of them. We've got them both in my office to this day. Image of the Storm is heavy on the pictures, and Eye of the Storm is heavy on the uh, diary. And lo and behold, look what we have. Bang. Had not been seen since the 19th century. And what was so great about this was you saw the winder map. It's just kind of a plain map. You saw the Harper's drawings. Not only is this in color, it shows the ancillary facilities of the prison system. It shows the road network, it shows the layout inside the stockade, the bridge, the sutler's shanty, POWs up in this area. That's going to be very valuable when the archaeologists began to look at it. They knew where to kind of look for where the POWs were. Shows the stream. Strangely enough, it does not show the spring at all. It shows the administrative offices, John Winder's headquarters right there. For a brief period of time, Camp Lawton was the headquarters of the Confederate military syst uh, prison system. It was, was at Camp Lawton. That's where he was stationed. He was in charge of the whole thing. Uh, it says rebel hospitals, prisoners hospital, barrier trenches, fort on the hill, rebel camp. So uh, th this is just amazing. Here's another drawing done at a different time. It looks a little different. And this, this is one of the things that I guess I, I kind of had to work through is, is, you know, these are wonderful drawings, but they also, they answer some questions, but they also generate more questions. <laughs> For example, the other shows it as rectangular, and Weiner's map shows it as square, and the uh, Sherman map shows it as square. I think it's going to be square, but you know, I got to thinking, from his perspective, th this is a valley here. And he came into the camp this way, and he left the camp this way, and, and, and he was a trustee. He was allowed to go out of the camp, and he worked with uh, Dr. Isaiah White, who was the camp surgeon. So he actually lived out here in a tent by the, by the doctor. So he's seen the prison up across the valley and the swale going up on the hill, and it probably looked rectangular to him. I don't think he really measured it, uh, per se. But again, it shows the, uh, the bridge here and where the, the POWs were, shows uh, burial trenches, Shows a rebel a camp in a slightly different position. Shows a, a, a stream here, which I, I don't think there's any evidence there was ever a stream there, but there it is. He shows that. And I think part of the problem here is he was at Camp Sumter, he was in Savannah, he was in Camp Lawton, he was in all, a number of Confederate prisons, and I think whatever sketches he made, he finished those sketches years later, and I think he'd gotten some things kind of mixed up. But, but still, very, very valuable view. Uh, this just uh, just floored us when we saw this. I, 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 was, I was so interested in this, I remember saying to myself, I can write a book on this. I've been collecting material for years. I can write a book on this. With this, it, 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 this just begs the question. Uh, here are the forts on the wrong side of the stream, for example. Fort should be over here on this, on this ridge here. But again, you can see there are the Evans, there are the POWs, there's the Sutler Shanty, uh, there are the latrines down there, and this area is uh, relatively empty. There's the gate. General Winder's headquarters there. Sutler Shane, look at that crowd. If you, a Sutler was a person who actually ran a, lot, a store in the prison. If you had money, you could buy things from it. And uh, you know, it looks almost like people lining up at uh, the Colvin House for their buffet. And there were the whole crowd there, and they're buying things or whatever. Of course, a lot of prisons had nothing at all, you know, at all. But uh, 
you're inside the stockade now and you go, go into the bridge. Those timbers that were found, it's possible those were bridge timbers that had, uh, once the camp was uh, destroyed, fell into the stream. It's, it's possible that's what they were. And here's again another view. Again, you can see the Sutler Shade, the bridge, the latrines down here. Here's the stream. And one of the things that's different about Camp Lawton than Andersonville, if you're in Andersonville, that stream is like this wide. They had 33,000 men trying to, you know, drink, go to the bathroom, bathe in that. It was a swampy morass. It still is, actually, when it rains. The, the banks of this are hard, uh, and, and they, all the prisoners generally commented on the quality of the water and the fact there wasn't a swamp down here or a morass where, where POWs were, you know, got stuck in the mud and so forth. Again, look at the, uh, look at the ovens there. And here's another view. You see the stream coming down through the camp, and there's the Sutler Shanty, and the POWs are up on this, this part of the ridge. There's the fort. That looks about right where it ought to be, where it is now. And then here's some close-ups. And again, this, this shows you part of the problem with Sneedon's material. This is, the, this is apparently the same corner of the stockade, and he draws these at different times. He draws the others looking differently. We know they had two cauldrons. We know that. Well, it's got, this is on the side. Here they're on either side. So we just, we just don't know, you know. Uh, and I'll show you some, some bricks that have been found in, in just a moment. Not only had I decided to write a book, but I didn't know it at the time, but the state of Georgia had, had, had noticed the steam material. And they, uh, the Department of uh, the Historic Preservation uh, Division, had contacted Georgia Southern University and their archaeological uh, group and asked them to go up there and survey the site, see if there's anything to be found. They didn't think they'd find anything. Uh, so, you know, over the years, there have been a number of archaeological explorations, but nothing much had been found. 2007, they found some charred, uh, you know, burned wood fragments, but really had not found much at all. But it wasn't until they really got serious they began to uh, find things. This is what the area looked like where the POWs resided. This is on the north side of the stream, but which by the way is federal property. Okay, the south side of the stream is state property, the north side is federal property. This is what it looks like. It's just it's just a wooded area. And so they were going to go in there and see what they could uh, what they could find. So I'm trying to educate you a little bit today. Here here's some of the techniques they used at Camp Lawton. They used GPR, ground penetrating radar. And uh, if you go to excuse me, if you go to if you go to uh, Camp Lawton, if you go to Bangalore Springs today, these trees have all been cut down. They, they, they clear cut that whole area. It's a field now. But this was an estate property here. And uh, ground penetrating radar, you grid out a section and it gives, you, uh, it gives you kind of a map of subsurface anomalies. And lo and behold, here's, here's what happened. So they found what they thought, what they thought, what, what they thought the corner was going to be, they found this L-shaped object. Uh, subsurface map. So they decided to sink trenches, begin to sink trenches uh, along this, and see if they could come up with soil stains for the wall. So using traditional archaeological techniques, what I call shovel, trial, brush, and screen techniques, slow process, they sank several trenches, and this was the trench that bore fruit. Now here you see they've actually are surveying, because modern, in modern archaeology, you want to precisely locate everything horizontally and vertically. Uh, and they were, the reason they were measuring this is they hit something. And lo and behold, this was the first evidence they had of hitting the wall. And I know that doesn't look like much to you, but that's a soil stain of two pieces, two, two logs, one that's fallen over the other one. And that's my shadow, which is also an artifact of this pr presentation. Uh, anyway, uh, notice though, he's about six feet deep here, and that, that puzzle and why they had to go so deep before they hit this, and they discovered by looking at old maps that there had been a sinkhole here, which had been filled in years later. Uh, so that, that explains uh, what had happened. And then another technique they use is MRI, which you've probably heard with hospitals and things, but again, that, that also shows up sub subsurface anomalies. And another technique they use, something you may not have heard of, is called LIDAR, uh, light detecting and ranging. And it's a, it's a system where you set up a scanner on the ground, and it will scan a horizontal surface. It'll actually scan a vertical surface, too, for the air. But it'll scan a horizontal surface, and it's digitized so you can discriminate out vertical uh, structures like trees and bushes. So you can scan a wooden area and see what it looks like without the trees there. 
And uh, so this shows what the fort looked like uh, up on top of the hill. When I first went up there, there was, it was all grown up. Uh, they've clear, they clear cut it, they've cut it out now. But you can see it's, it's pentagonal shaped. Uh, you can see you've got artillery ramps at the corners. And you know, one of the things that inter interests me is this fortification points outward. I think it's more of a defensive fortification for the camp rather than an offensive fortification aimed at the stockade. But there was always the potential, if there was a prisoner rider attempt to break down the walls, they could fire artillery into the stockade, grape shot, and cause all sorts of damage. But the point of the fortification is pointed away from the camp. So it's, I think it's more of a defensive fortification against a cavalry raid than anything else. Another thing that they uh, are, are, are using is uh, dendrochronology, so uh, basically the idea is to take core samples. By the way, recently they found more logs in the stream, pull them out, and so they're going to, I don't know what kind of database they have of all trees in the area, but they're going to compare the uh, tree rings with whatever else that they can uh, come up with a comparative period and see if they can date it. That's the best way to date it. These may not have anything to do with the stockade, uh, they may be from the Civilian Conservation Corps period, it may be from a, you know, another period, but they're going to find out, I think. Another technique they use, of course, is metal detecting. And I want to show you, uh, this is a sample metal detection map. What the archaeologists did in the room where the POWs were, they, 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 they uh, surveyed out several lines, and then they went around the lines, and at intervals, metal detected. No one had ever found much there before. Uh, not much. I, mean, I hear these rumors, oh, we used to find this stuff, all. but no one had really found much before. And so well, these are the hits in this particular area. Now let me show you how the uh, archaeologists uh, interpret this. Okay. So what you've got here are these artifact clusters they think are shebangs where the POWs built their little huts. Okay. They think that the line line ran along here, because you've got kind of a gap through here, and then they found clusters of historic nails back from where they think the wall was. The nails were burned. And if you know anything about nails, you, know, you can burn a nail and it'll stay in the soil for a long time without it rusting or corroding. They're historic nails, and they think that when the stockade was burned, Union troops burned the stockade, the pigeon roost fell, and of course they were nailed together, and that's why you have the clusters of nails at these intervals along the wall. That's what they're, that's what they're thinking. I was talking to the uh, chief archaeologist just Monday, and he said they have found the back wall. I mean, they found, definitely found where the back wall is. So now they have three walls, uh, know where those are. So one more wall, they'll be able to know where the corners were. Now, I think you probably all remember, about three years ago, or you know, a little, almost three years ago, in August uh, of, of 2000, uh, there was this big event that occurred at, at Magnolia Springs. And, uh, you know, before that, there were rumors. They found something. They found something. People were saying they found Confederate gold. They found this. They found that. People were coming to me or, uh, in Swainsworth saying, you know what's going on, don't you? I said, well, I can't tell you. You know, and I did. Because what happened was this. I was writing my book. When I found out that Georgia Southern was doing the dig, I called Dr. Sue Moore, who's an old friend of mine, and I, I asked her, I said, are you, are you doing it? You guys digging over there? She said, yeah. She said, I said, well, I'm writing a book. She said, you are? I said, yeah. She said, come up Saturday, and I'll walk you around, introduce you to the person who's leading the dig, and uh, we'd, we'd like to talk with you. So, because I had all these sources. So I became the project historian for this, uh, for this dig. I shared with them my sources. They told me what was going on, okay? So on August 18th, they had this big event, and all these, all these folks, you know, I was there, uh, Fish and Game, CNN, George Public, NPR, you know, AJC, Fox News, and they were all there, you know, and uh, to see what was, was going to be unveiled. And they had tables set up uh, covered in dark cloth. Uh, <laughs> and at a certain point, after all our speeches were over, uh, they, they unveiled what had been found. Now, I'm going to show you a brief selection of, of, of what's been found. And, and really, this is a small portion. They found hundreds and hundreds of items in 1% of the property. They've they got years of work here, okay? First thing is, this is an Austrian finnig. And you say, well, an Austrian coin? And notice it's dated 1862. Many of the soldiers of the Civil War were immigrants. And I know a lot of people think we have a lot of immigrants in the country today. As a percentage of the population, we had much more in the 19th century. So you had whole regiments of German troops and Irish troops, French troops, and so forth. And uh, so it would not be unusual 
to know to find a German coin here. We found a lot of other German stuff here too because there were Ohio regiments, members of Ohio regiments, members of Pennsylvania regiments who were, who were imprisoned at Camp Lawton for a brief period of time. Here's a, a cut large cent, a large penny <laughs> cut in half. And one of the problems in the prisons was, was money. There was a lot of trading that went on. So part of this penny was cut in half and was used as, as, as some sort of trade good. An Argentine coin, this is one of the more recent finds. When I was teaching a class over at Georgia Southern last year, the, I had three of the archaeology students in my class. They came in green one day and said, we found something, you know, and I said, well, what was it? And they, sh they showed me the picture uh, of, of this. Uh, 1831, who knows? Could have been somebody's birth coin, you know, that would make sense, uh, but uh, there it was. Then here's a lot of buttons, and buttons actually sometimes were used as trade goods. Confederate soldiers wanted those gilt buttons because a lot of times they just had bones or wooden buttons, handmade buttons, and they would trade the Union POWs for their buttons. They weren't supposed to, it was illegal, it's black market, but they did it anyway. And so the Union prisoners wanted things like tobacco, newspapers, you know, that kind of thing. So this is a, a New York uh, button. Here is a, uh, a, a regular infantry button, or a standard issue infantry button. Kepi buckle, little kepi hats. You can think of the Civil War as a little buckle on it. That's a kepi buckle. Haversack hooks, notice the patent date, 1855 here. And uh, these are still made. You know, reenactors, you know, you utilize these things still. The same kind of pattern. And of course, they found a uh, 58 caliber infield round. This is a mini ball. You know, mini balls are not round, they're conical. And uh, you expect to find these things around. And then, what's interesting about this slide here is this is, the, this is the standard kind of infantry weapon of the American Civil War. And this, we reached the high point of rifled uh, percussion cap muskets. Now, this is the high tech, this is the end of, of that, that particular technology. And then it began to move to shells. And this is a carbine shell. Uh, we're going to move to breech loaders, and you see both of them there at Camp Lawton. Uh, a core badge, the, the uh, uh, 12th Corps and the 20th Corps both use the star as their symbol, and the 20th Corps was one of Sherman's corps, so it may very well have been from a, a person who was in Sherman's corps. It's very small, so it's like a, like a cap badge. And then the, here's a third Corps badge. The third Corps used a diamond shape, and this is found, it's bent here, the folded in, 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 in the bottom, but this is the third Corps badge. And then here's the third Corps badge ring that some soldier left. They were proud of being in, their, in these units and they, they would wear these because sometimes they wore cloth patches just like soldiers do today. But sometimes they had these kinds of things as well. This is kind of a poignant thing. This is a tourniquet buckle. Still had some cloth attached to it. And you know what a tourniquet's used for is to stem bleeding when there's been a, you know, an arterial uh, bleed uh, and it was found there as well. And Every news article on Camp Lawton that had a picture showed this, you know. This is a homemade pipe. A person took a broken clay pipe. He had the stem. Davidson's the maker, not the person who owned it. Had the pipe stem. The person melted some lead, probably from mini balls, melted some lead and made a bowl. There's a bowl there, and you can actually draw through there. It's about this long. It's very small, but it's very heavy on the end, you can imagine. And you can actually see the bite marks of the smoker here. So some Union POW uh, was, you know, developed his own way of smoking, and they would, you know, they would try to trade for tobacco, but they would smoke substitutes as well uh, if they could, and the guards would, would too. Heel plates, soldiers used heel plates to protect their heels, uh, you know, from wearing out. Uh, they found many of these. Some of them are horseshoe shaped, some of them com you know, completely cover the heel. When I did the Sherman's March tour Saturday, uh, the, the guy that I came up to reenact who was dressed in a Union uniform, he had a complete heel plate just like this. This is a uh, folding daguerreotype frame. And if you're familiar with those old daguerreotypes, the amber types, they're on glass. And many soldiers carried them. They were using a little case and a little cover, and they would carry them. And uh, they were somewhat fragile, but they'd be pictures of, of uh, you know, girlfriends, pictures of wives, families, or whatever. And you can imagine probably this guy's got broken. And so it said just throw in the frame away, he folded it, and it was, le it was left there and found. 
German token. This is a German, some kind of German game coin. It actually has a picture of George Washington on it. George Washington was a popular figure in 19th century Europe. A lot of people, a lot of immigrants had come after the revolutions of 1848 in Europe. So they, they had fled uh, what they used oppression to come to the land of freedom. And George Washington was a symbol of that. And this, uh, this Latin phrase, I guess, could be roughly be translated strength through unity. Store tokens. Around here, a lot of older people will tell you that there were stores during the Depression that issued tokens, you know, which you could redeem. Well, the same way they did, too. This is Heinz and Hinckley, and, you know, again, good German names, Columbus, Ohio. If you go to Columbus, Ohio, there's still a section, an old section of town called Germantown. And uh, you can still find this address. It tells you, that, you know, the corner of 4th and Friend Street, Columbus, Ohio, grocery token. Michigan store token. Again, there were some Michigan POWs there. And uh, you can see the, the name of the store, grocery token, and uh, also has an eagle on the, on the reverse. A lot of money utensils. Very few of them standard issue, but, but some of our soldiers tended to carry their, uh, their stuff from home. They would carry forks and spoons and knives. And actually, believe it or not, POWs were often allowed to keep their pocket knives when they were in prison. Uh, they used that you know, for eating, but also all sorts of things. And uh, these are some of the ones that were found. Here's a clip. This, uh, I couldn't figure out what this was. The archaeologists couldn't figure out what it was. They looked and looked and looked in catalogs and books. And can anybody guess what that was? It's a suspender clip. And when we were, and it's obvious, but it took us forever to figure out what it was. But it, the clips look very much like that today. This is some kind of a piece of jewelry. You don't know what, what that is. Uh, here's a uh, black powder pistol cylinder, 7 round, 22 caliber, which may not have anything to do with prison, but it was found on site. Uh, a lot of people have hunted that area after the Civil War, but this pistol, this type of pistol was available during the Civil War, uh, and it was found, so I've got it there for you to look at. Bricks are found throughout the area, throughout the area. We know that the POWs at night, when the bricks were brought in to build the ovens, the POWs at night would sneak up and steal bricks and line their shebangs and make little rudimentary stoves and make little smokestacks and things. But we think this is not inside because you've got mortar, fragments of mortar attached to it. And these are historic brick. And what was interesting is the, uh, the archaeologists told me that they were able to detect bricks with metal detectors. And I said, it's probably because of the iron content, maybe, you know, and they said, that's probably it. But you, you wouldn't think that, you know, but they were able to, able to, they would get hits on bricks with metal detectors. But, but another part of the story, not just archaeology, but textual discoveries. And that's one of the things, when I started writing the book, I thought I had everything I needed. Boy, the Sneedon stuff was there, and I'd been fiddling around with this for 35 years or so, and I thought I had everything I needed. And I really started doing serious research because I knew if I wrote an academic book, I was going to have to cover all the bases. And I started finding material I had no idea existed. Uh, if you, you buy a copy of my book, look at a copy of my book, you're going to see I have an extensive bibliography, hundreds of footnotes. And so I found many letters I was not aware of, found uh, diary uh, things I was not aware of. Let me give you an example of that. This is a uh, letter written by uh, Charles H. Knox. And notice it's written, uh, he started to say camp, then he scratched that. It says Lawton Prison, Georgia, November 14, 1864. At the time uh, I became aware of this, I only knew of two letters that, that were around that had come out of the prison. And I like this because he's from Connecticut. He wrote back to his wife, and uh, he says he's hoping to be exchanged. And he says, he says, uh, he says, he's, he's, uh, uh, his, he starts his life, says, have any chance to sing along into God's land? <laughs> and then he goes on and says, he hopes to be exchanged for an entire secession, which is not God's land to him. So uh, that's, uh, you, you find those kinds of, uh, those, those kinds of uh, interesting quotes in, in some of these letters. And uh, since then, uh, I actually found that letter, or had someone tell me about that letter, and then I told the folks at Georgia Southern, they bought that letter, and then they found this guy's, the, they found the family of this person, and found his uh, National Association of Union X POW medal. <laughs> and this is it, it's kind of bold, you wear, you know, on your, on your coat, and you, know, you have the American Eagle, 
you have the, you know, the knapsack here, you have the crossed rifles. And then this was the POW symbol, because these guys would have reunions after the Civil War. And so what you've got, here's the stock here, this is Andersonville, because that's all everybody was interested in was Andersonville. It was the hellhole. I mean, 33,000 prisoners, 13,000 died. I mean, it was genuine hellhole. I mean, there's no defense of it at all, okay? Uh, it, it was bad, okay? So here's the stockade. You've got artillery in each of the four corners. And it says, death before dishonor. And then in the middle of the stockade, you have a prisoner being attacked by a dog. That was another motif that Northerners always talk about Southern prisons. If you escape, the hound dogs are going to track you down. And they always just said the dogs would, would maul the prisoner before the guards would pull them off. You know, that, that, that was the legend. Okay, that was the legend. Uh, and here is his lapel pin, same motif, stockade, death before dishonor, the dog attacking the Union XPOW, and the artillery at the four corners. Now, Camp Rock was open for six weeks. It's been all that longer to build that prison. It was open for six weeks. It was closed last week of uh, November, 1864, because Sherman was on his way from Atlanta to Savannah. Sherman is going to arrive in that area about December 3rd, 1864. The camp was evacuated about December, about, uh, about November 25th. So they, they, they got the prisoners out. They loaded them on the railroad train. They took them down to Savannah. From Savannah, they took them down to Blackshear. Blackshear, they went to Thomasville. From Thomasville, the poor guys ended up back at Andersonville. I've got a very poignant letter where one of the POWs who had been to Andersonville, he made that whole trip and it's Christmas Eve, and he says, here I am standing before the gate of Andersonville once again. Uh, and he was gonna stay there until the spring of the next year. Uh, the weather got very cold. Uh, the, I've, tr I've tried to track the weather by looking at newspaper sources and so forth, but it seems to have been nights were in the 20s, days were in the 40s, and we're talking about POWs not having coats. Uh, a lot of them would, would simply sleep during the day and walk all night to keep from freezing. They would try to cook their food and eat it as hot as they could at night to keep themselves warm. Uh, there was ice forming the edges of the stream. There were the day, they, the night they were evacuated, they were evacuated at night, early in the morning. Uh, it was a freezing rain, about 2 a.m. They were rousted out of their, uh, their shebangs. And I think that's why we think so much of this has been found, because they didn't have time to pack everything up. They were told, get out and let's go, you know, and that's, that's why we think so much was left. What's so significant about Camp Lawton is every basic POW issue of the Civil War can be found here. Every basic issue. Uh, and this is also a pristine site. Civil War has been worked over and over and over. It's the most popular uh, period of American history. More books written about Civil War than any other period. How many histories of Gettysburg? How many histories of Antietam? You know, how many histories of this and that? M my book's the first book on this. It's, I was pure luck. It's a pristine site. The archaeologists are finding all sorts of stuff. They're finding many more things than Andersonville ever had because it was so picked over. In October, last October 2012, Oregon Public Broadcasting uh, came up and spent a week. Uh, they have a, a program called Time Team America, which is kind of an archaeological mystery show. So they spent a week there, and they brought all sorts of equipment in, all sorts of uh, expertise in, and they invited me and some others. They interviewed us on camera and so forth. And they scanned the areas. They did GPR. They did and so forth. And so they have left us a tremendous database that for years will allow us to, to, to you know, look beyond this uh, where we are now. But they also found some stuff. They found some exciting things. And the most exciting thing was not this. <laughs> the, the next slide. Here's some of the stuff they pulled from the stream. And uh, again, possibly has something to do with Camp Lawton. We don't know, but they're going to have to try to try to do the dendrochronology on it. There's the stream. You can see the, you see the uh, banks are, are, are hard banks. It's not a swampy kind of thing. So they found those, in addition to those other two big uh, beams that I showed that were found in the 70s. This is the most exciting thing. There's the stockade. They open up a trench, and you can see the stains of the logs. It's very clear, and there's actually some fragments of wood in some of them. So that, that gave us the second wall. We had the first wall, that gave us the second wall, and Lance Green, as I said, just told me they found the third wall in the back, so they just need one more wall to find. So you can, you can see the, uh, the stockade there. Now, 
I like to have a problem with this slide because in a way it kind of wraps everything up. That Saturday when I first went up to look at the dig, a couple things happened. First thing that happened was when someone introduced me to the person leading the dig, he was a graduate student. This was his master's thesis. He was uh, seeing the time, go up there and see, there's not going to be much work to it, go up there and see what you can find. That student was named Kevin Chapman. Kevin Chapman's a former student of mine. We haven't seen each other in years, but he went to East Georgia College. That's where he started, and then he you know, went on and, and so forth, and then came back to graduate school. So East Georgia College has a fairly substantial role, I think, in what's, what's been going on. And I always remind the folks at Georgia Southern that Kevin's an East Georgia College student, too. They always want to talk about Georgia Southern, Georgia Southern, okay. Second thing that happened was two people showed up that day. One was a descendant of a guard who had been at Camp Lawton. His name was Doug Carter, nice guy. His ancestor was Jesse Tolliver Carter, and he was in the third Georgia Reserves. He was a guard. He was a teenager. That's what reserve units were. The reserve units were made up of, of teenagers and older men who were not suitable for frontline duty, although they were sometimes put in frontline duty when they had to, okay? Also showing up was a woman named Mona Wraith, whose ancestor, Sebastian Glanzer, a German immigrant, had been at Camp Lawton. And she brought a photograph of him. She had a big photograph of him, typical 19th century family photograph. Doug said, let me show you something. He went over to his car, he opened his trunk, he pulled out this gun. He said, this is what my ancestor carried at Camp Lawton. It's not a military rifle. It is a fouling piece. It's a single shot shotgun, basically, percussion cap. The cap's gone now. Uh, the lock, I mean, is gone now. But he said he was not issued a weapon, and so he took the family shotgun with him. And that's true. A lot of reserve units, they didn't, a lot of them didn't have you know, complete equipment. And so that's on display now at George Southern in, in the museum. Sebastian Glantz's portrait's on display. But I like this picture because here we are, you know, descendant of guard, descendant of POW, uh, with arms around each other, holding each other, uh, you know, kind of a, an ultimate reconciliation, perhaps, down through the generations. And they both stayed very active in this, uh, in this, uh, in this whole process. Now, uh, if you could, uh, well, I, guess, I, I think there's enough light here, just so I'm gonna do one more thing before I get completely done here. Oops. <laughs> Casualty already. One of the things I tried to do in the book was I tried to focus on the human interest. And what I did is I tried to find out what had happened to some of the POWs. What, what had they done in life? What, what had they gone on? Now, about 750 of them died there uh, and uh, were buried there, and then later their bodies were moved to Beaufort, South Carolina. But let me read you just briefly a. Uh, Get this light, this light turned where I can see. Yeah, let me read just briefly an account. But I think this is kind of interesting of, of what happened to one of them, and I have a personal connection with this. New Yorker Daniel Reed Ross had a remarkable odyssey as a POW and afterwards. He had been captured on June 22, 1864. By the time he arrived at Camp Lawton that fall, he was already a veteran of Camp Oglethorpe in Macon, Camp Sumter in Charleston in turn. Following the evacuation of Camp Lawton, his all-expense-paid trip through the Confederate prison system included stops at Blackshear, Camp Sumter, Charleston, Florence, and the Confederate prison at Cahaba, Alabama. He was liberated on April 2, 1865, when Union General James H. Wilson's cavalry reached Selma. Returned to active duty the following month, Ross found himself stationed in Augusta, Georgia, when on May 13th, the recently captured Confederate President Jefferson Davis and his family arrived under guard in the city. Ironically, ex-POW Private Ross was then detailed as a guard and accompanied the Davises all the way to Fortress Monroe, which they reached on May 23rd. So Ross, who had been a POW, is now finds himself guarding the Confederate president. He missed the grand review of Sherman's army on May 24th in Washington, D.C., and was mustered out with his regiment on June 8th. Interestingly, his younger brother, John Ross, one of Sherman's soldiers, visited the prison on the way to Savannah, not realizing that his brother had been incarcerated there and he had just missed him by a few days. Following his experience of being a POW and his service as a guard as Jefferson Davis and family were transported to Fortress Monroe, Ross went to medical school in Ohio and rather than returning to his home state, took up residence as the first doctor in the little town of Hedgesville, West Virginia, where he remained until his death in 1924. His obituary in the Shepherdstown Register described him as, quote, a venerable physician and a native of New York State, but had lived in Berkeley County for the past 50 years. 
The beloved country doctor, whose charitable comments toward his former enemies were, were earlier cited, and early in the book I had quoted him, he, 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 he respected the Confederate soldiers, the, the field soldiers. Settled in what had been a border area during the war and made a successful career working with patients, some of whom had served in Confederate butternut, others of whom had enlisted in Union Blue. Ross Impressive House, 1885, still stands in Hedgesville, and the simple but impressive stone marking his and his wife's grave is easily found in the village cemetery. Let me tell you the personal connection with this. Uh, some years ago, before I ever started writing, working on this book, my son moved to West Virginia. He moved to a little town called Hedgesville. And when I found out this connection, you know, I went out and said, Mark, let's, it was one winter, I said, I want to find this house. Because I found the house on the National Register list. So I went to Hedgesville and went to the fire station and I, you know, I said, I, I had a picture, I said, where is this house? And they showed me. And so I, I went down there. This house is a two-story house, beautiful house, there's a cupola on top, and it literally is down the street across the road from where my grandson goes to school, or went to school. I didn't know what had happened to Ross, other than I knew he died, so there was a little village cemetery there, so it was a snowy day, it was, the ground was covered with snow, so we wandered through the cemetery and I found the grave. I said it's easily found, I had to look for it, actually. So uh, I, was, I was talking, to, uh, I was doing, I was telling this program one time, telling this story one time to uh, a group in our church, you know, somebody came up to me and said, he said, John, that is not a coincidence. <laughs> There's something else going on here. But I've got several stories like that about what happened to, to folks. I've got a story about a person who decided to move west after the Civil War, uh, an immigrant who'd come from Ireland and uh, what happened to him after the war and so forth in the book. If you're interested in a book, I, I do have a few. I don't have many. They've sold so fast, I'm, I'm kind of embarrassed. I only have maybe eight or nine today. I will get more, but the $30, they retail for $35, but I'll sell them for $30 uh, here today. Uh, let me stop here. I've kind of pushed myself to get through the period. Let's see if we've got any questions. I'll be glad to answer anything. I must have just completely covered it. Yeah, okay, H hang on, yeah. Brick was, uh, brick was brought from Macon. In fact, uh, uh, Winder complained to the Confederate government that he had the brick on the siding in Macon and he could not get the railroad to bring the brick to him. What he said was happening was, is uh, some of the wealthier uh, people who were fleeing ahead of Sherman they were, they were loading their stuff off the train. They were getting preferential. He said, I need the brick for the prison. This is an official operation. So it came out of Macon. It's handmade. It was handmade brick. Uh, it, so it, it's what they call a historic brick. It looks a little different than, than the brick today. Yes. Right. Right. And, you know, and Macon was a strategic place because the Confederate laboratory was there. And, uh, and uh, you know they, they thought Sherman was going to take Macon, but he actually that wasn't his goal. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. What happened to the bodies of those who died? It's a, it's a little bit of a mystery in terms of numbers, but I think it's probably between 725 and 750 that died. I've seen the death register in the National Archives, but it's incomplete. It, it ends at a date before the camp was evacuated. So what happened was, when the Civil War was over, the federal government sent teams around all across the South to, uh, to locate where federal burials were. They weren't concerned about Confederate dead at all, it was federal burials. Because they wanted to locate those, and they wanted to consolidate those burials. So they decided, believe it or not, to make a national cemetery at Lawtonville, at, at, which was right there by Magnolia Springs. So they, ex they exhumed the bodies from the trenches, they got a four acre plot of land from the lady who owned the, the property. Uh, and they, they reburied the bodies, had markers identified the ones they knew, put a fence around it. It lasted for less than a year. And then there was a dispute between the United States Army and the woman over the land. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what it was. I think it was a price dispute. And so what they did is then the quartermaster general's office in Savannah, Georgia, 
uh, said, uh, to heck with this, let's, let's, let's put it in Buford. We've got the land in Buford. So the bodies of the Camp Lawton dead are in Buford. Some are identified, some are unknown. And uh, always some of them were unknown, but uh, you can find, uh, if, you're, if you have an ancestor, sometimes you can actually find the exact grave. And I've got maps of that and everything. I, did, I didn't show you the whole thing. You've got the short version today. Yes, there's a National Cemetery in Beaufort. I've got pictures of that too. I've been there a couple times, and when I was researching the book, I went back. When I first started researching this, somebody just told me I think they're in Beaufort. And so I wrote the, the cemetery superintendent and asked, and he, he said, yeah, we've got records of bodies being transferred. I didn't know the whole story, but I found out the whole story eventually. But that's where they are now, yeah. And so it wasn't just Camp Lawton dead, but there were Sherman soldiers, some of whom had died on the march, were buried in fields and things like that, and they, they, they tried to locate all those and, and, and first put them at, Camp, at the Lawton National Cemetery, then moved them to Beaufort, South Carolina. But there's a, that's something I'd like to find that site, uh, just to know where it was. I think, I, I think we have a rough idea of where it was, and we'd like to find the burial trenches too. Not that there's any bodies there, but just to know where it was, you know, and I think we have, have a good idea of where those were too. Yes, sir. You know, they, they, they impressed local slaves, but I don't doubt that there might have been a, a camp where they stayed day after day. Three, apparently, 300 Union POWs from Savannah were given, you know, they, they actually went and said, if, if, you'll, if you'll help with this project, you'll get out of prison, we'll give you better rations, and so forth. So about 300 also helped build, build the stockade. Uh, I will tell you this, the archaeologists are on the hunt for all that. <laughs> <laughs> they are, and I think they're going to find, I, I think they're going to find a lot of those ancillary facilities that Sneedon drew, because that's really given them an idea of where things were. And uh, so you've got almost a pristine site that wasn't, wasn't farmed much, you know, there was no, you know, buildings built over it, there's no parking lot, or it, it's almost a pristine site, that's what's excited them so much. And the reason the fence went up, and the reason the motion detectors were placed in the woods, and the reason the wildlife cameras were put in the woods, is not because, you know, there was gold there, it's because if you've ever been around Civil War relic collectors, they will rob you blind. And they knew people would go right in those woods at night, and, and, take, and, and they just ruin, they, those folks ruin the Civil War heritage. Because then you don't know where it came from, precisely, you can't, you can't locate it relative to other artifacts, and so it just completely loses its context. It's kind of cute to have and look at, but it doesn't mean anything. And you know, once you've removed it from the site and you don't know where it was or anything like that. So that's, that's why they did that. 24-7 security still. Yeah. Well, immediately after this, I'm gonna, I got a table out there and I'll bring them out. It must have taken them about a month or six weeks, which still amazes me for hand labor. Cut the trees down. That's, there, there must have been thousands of trees. Cut the trees down, haul them to the site, trim them, dig that trench mile long, do all the backfilling and everything. I mean, that was, that was a lot of work. Of course, they were using mules and things to haul the logs, but I mean, it still was a lot of work. There was a lumber mill downstream, but apparently they used unhewn logs for the stockade. They probably used the, the lumber mill to build some of those buildings, you know, the administrative buildings. Anything else? Well, I'll be glad to answer any questions after the program. Thank you for your attendance. Appreciate it.